Americans invented the video magnetic tape recorder, but it was the Japanese who brought it to the masses as the VCR. Throughout the 1980s, virtually every home VCR sold in America was made in Japan, even the ones sold by American brands like RCA. How did Japan come to dominate a device they didn't create? Today, we are going to look at the rise and reign of Japanese VCRs. But first, I want to remind you about the newsletter. Sign up for updates and new analysis, the full scripts of selected popular videos, and more. The sign up link is in the video description below. I try to put one out every week, maybe two. All right, back to the show. Sound is a wave in the air. Yes, we are starting with sound. So if we want to record a song, we recreate that wave shape in another medium. That is the working concept behind Edison's phonograph and virtually every other sound recorder since then. In the 1920s, we had a series of recorders that used solid metal wires and the like to record and play back sound. These setups were not very practical and broke easily. In response to this deficiency, in 1928, the German engineer Fritz Flumer coated some paper tape with an iron oxide. The resulting magnetic tape, as he called it, was a far more suitable recording medium. Though, you wouldn't know it from how it performed at the start. The, quote, sound paper machine, end quote, did not produce good sound. The magnetic particles would fly off the tape while it was playing. People nicknamed it the sandpaper machine. Flumer tried to make something out of his invention, but surprisingly failed, selling the patent rights to a German electrical equipment company called AEG. Working with IG Farben, AEG improves the device to produce the magnetophon in 1934. The magnetophon has all the basic elements of today's practical tape recorder, capable of recording high-fidelity sound for far longer than before. It became popular in Germany, where it was used to broadcast propaganda and strange German music. But due to the war and all, the technology was not exported abroad to the United States. In July 1945, two months after Germany surrendered, a member of the U.S. Army Signal Corps, John Thomas Mullen, went to Germany. Mullen had heard reports of the German stations broadcasting 24-hour programs of strange German music that sounded too good to be pre-recorded. A British Army officer then tells him to go to Frankfurt and check out the magnetic tape systems being used there by Radio Frankfurt. Intrigued, Mullen travels to Frankfurt, to be more precise, a health resort 45 miles north of Frankfurt where the station had been moved to avoid the bombing. There, he asks the staff to demonstrate their magnetophon. What he hears is beautiful. As he recalls, there was simply no background noise. The radio station staff had no idea that they had been using such an advanced technology. Mullen legally acquired two devices and 50 reels of magnetic tape for study back at his home in San Francisco. He apparently broke them apart and sent the pieces home in 35 mail bags over two months in order to meet war souvenir regulations. Back home, he repairs the systems. In May 1946, Mullen presented the results of his work at the Institute of Radio Engineers, today the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. It blew the audience away. Present at that 1946 presentation were a few employees of a small company called Ampex Corporation. Ampex was a seven-person company founded back in 1944 in San Carlos. They produced aircraft motors during the war and that did well for them. But now the war was over, and they were looking for what was next. What they heard at the 1946 demonstration got them extremely interested. With Mullins' help, the small Redwood City-based startup produced and released the Ampex 200 sound magnetic tape recorder. The 200 got its big break thanks to the Hollywood star Bing Crosby. Mr. Crosby apparently preferred to pre-record and edit his national radio show rather than doing it live. Unfortunately, the audio quality of these recordings suffered tremendous distortion and thus sucked. In June 1947, Mullen demonstrated the machine to Crosby's associates and then to Crosby himself. They were so impressed with the quality of the edited audio that they pre-ordered $50,000 worth of new Ampex 200 recorders to fund commercialization. Later, Crosby helped introduce the Ampex 200 to radio stations, the machine revolutionized the field thanks to their sound quality, ease of use, and ease of editing. Magnetic tape technology spread around the world. Companies in the United States, 
Europe, and Japan rapidly adopted the technology for recording sound. After audio, video was an obvious evolutionary step, but a far more difficult one. In 1951, David Sarnoff, chairman of RCA, challenged his company to produce a television picture recorder that would record the video signals of television. Such a device would be helpful for transmitting TV programs across the nation at the proper viewing times. For instance, New York City and Los Angeles are three time zones apart. So if the stations wanted to play a 6 p.m. program at each city's local 6 p.m. time, then the show had to be pre-recorded. For that, a high-quality video recording medium was required. There wasn't one then, so the stations recorded a screen with a film movie camera. Yes, really. It was called Kinescope Film. The core issue with video magnetic tape recording is data. Video is far more data-rich than sound. Video signals range about 4.2 MHz, while audio signals top out at about 20 kHz. So video carries about 200 times more data than audio. Contemporary high-quality audio systems worked by pulling a quarter-inch wide magnetic tape across a single immobile recording head at a rate of about 38 centimeters per second. Scaling up this system without any changes would mean the tape would have to run at about 200 miles per hour, which is like Formula One speeds. The mechanics of such a system are unworkable. So RCA's team produced a magnetic tape video machine with a two inch wide tape running by multiple heads at about 600 centimeters per second. With this, a 15 minute TV program can be put on a 50 centimeter reel. An impressive engineering feat, but it is better to work smarter than harder. And that is what Ampex did. The team at Ampex came across a design by Marvin Cameras of the Armor Research Foundation of Chicago. Cameras design put recording heads on a spinning drum. The drum spun in a direction perpendicular to that of the magnetic videotape. So if the tape is going left and right, then the drum is going up and down. The tape now doesn't have to travel at a very high absolute speed because there is a very high relative speed between said magnetic tape and the heads on the drum. Ampex's team licensed the technology and modified it. Their quadruplex transverse scan design had four recording heads on a drum rotating at about 14,400 revolutions per minute. In April 1956, Ampex announced their video tape recorder, or VTR, the Ampex VR1000, which was later renamed to the Mark IV at the National Association of Broadcasters Convention. The VR1000 was an immediate hit. It cost $45,000 to $50,000, but it saved ABC and CBS $10,000 a week from terrible kinescope film recordings of TV broadcasts. Ampex took 82 orders in its first weekend. Ampex's success was an embarrassment for the venerable RCA, doubly so when it came out later that an RCA engineer had patented a similar spinning head idea like the one Ampex used. The RCA team had simply missed it. Chairman Sarnoff cancelled the project and licensed the Ampex technology for $200,000. By 1961, Ampex would sell nearly 900 VTRs, 300 of them overseas. Revenue had exploded from $10 million in 1956 to nearly $70 million in 1960. They were the dominant provider in the space with 75% market share. Just two years after the machine's invention, Japan started importing the VR-1000. The Japanese TV broadcast market was growing. New TV stations were being opened all across the country, and they wanted video recording equipment. Despite their high price, about 25 million yen, VTRs were very popular. Japan's Ministry of Trade and Industry, MIDI, noticed this surge in imports. Worried that their domestic market might become dominated by American products, they sought to develop a domestic VTR to temper this excessive demand. They offered small subsidies to companies looking to copy the Ampex. Japan's NHK Broadcasting Channel had imported the first Ampex VR1000, so MIDI coordinated with them to offer NHK facilities and its imported machine for a study by interested parties. These parties included Matsushita, 
Toshiba, Shiba Electronics, and Sony. Sony had once been quite interested in the video recording business in the mid-1950s. They worked on some fixed-head recording prototypes, but set that work aside in order to pursue more promising transistor technology. The MIDI study group got them back into it. Working with NHK, they managed to copy the Ampex VR1000 in just three months. Impressed by this feat of engineering, Sony co-founder Masaru Ibuka asked his team to produce a version of the device for home use, but such a machine would need some re-engineering. The transverse scanning machine is a nice design, but there is still a great deal of mechanical complexity. Engineers at Ampex, RCA, and Toshiba saw an opportunity to simplify this, inventing a new setup called the helical scan. With helical scans, we still have magnetic tape and tape heads on a spinning drum, but they are tilted so that the heads read the tape at a diagonal angle. So now, we can put the whole frame on a single diagonal track on the tape. It is a more efficient use of the tape's surface area, meaning it doesn't have to run the tape as fast. Ampex adopted the helical scan for their next generation video broadcasting equipment, and then they taught it to Sony. Ampex did ponder the concept of a VTR for the home. A reporter at the original 1956 broadcasting convention quoted Ampex President George Long's remarks. Eventually, VTRs might be mass-produced for home use by persons who want to see a program over and over again or want it recorded during their absence. Imagine that, watching a TV show whenever you want in the comfort of your own home. In 1960, Ampex reached out to Sony in order to establish a technical alliance. They had seen some of Sony's work in transistorizing radios and wanted their help in transistorizing their broadcasting equipment. The deal was that Sony would provide its transistor technology in exchange for knowledge on Ampex's helical scan and other video recording technologies. The end result would be a transistorized Ampex VCR for the home. But that same year, Ampex fell into a sales slump thanks to a runaway consumer electronics diversification drive, overlapping inefficiencies and intensifying competition in its core VTR market. In 1961, they appointed a new CEO, William Roberts, a management consultant, to bring the company out of its troubles. Ampex and Roberts decided to unilaterally pull out of the joint venture with Sony. The reasons for this are not entirely clear. A prominent Ampex employee later claimed it was due to financial reasons. Roberts and his team were apparently nervous over the potential capital outlays and did not believe in the home consumer VTR market. Another contemporary source says that Roberts was concerned about Sony stealing their technology, and yet another said it was due to licensing disputes over a critical Ampex patent. Whatever the reason, the ill-fated joint venture left Sony with a license to a few Ampex patents and a determination to pursue the home consumer VTR market. Anyone else getting Nintendo PlayStation vibes? Why are all these people pissing Sony off? Anyway, Ampex largely stayed out of the home consumer market over the next few years. They did release the VR1500, called the first commercially available VTR. But that thing was big, 72 centimeters wide, 36 centimeters tall, and 43 centimeters long. The whole thing also weighed about 100 pounds, which is the average weight of a baby hippo. Thus, it was too large and unwieldy to be popular. Roberts wanted to maintain the company's buoyant stock market price, so he had Ampex stick to their old bread and butter business of selling high margin video broadcasting equipment for hundreds of thousands of dollars, until perhaps it was too late. Sony's style has been to bring high technology to the masses. Combining the helical scan technology with their transistor expertise, Sony released their first VTR product, the PV100, in 1962. Transistors enabled the PV100 to be far smaller than the equivalent Ampex product, weighing just 60 kilograms, and its innovative two-head helical scanner allowed it to evade Ampex's patents. American Airlines bought 26 for their airplanes, and its slow-motion replay function made it quite useful at the 1964 Olympics, then being held in Tokyo. 
But Sony never targeted this VTR for the home consumer, preferring professional and CCTV use cases. It did seem to do quite well as a CCTV device. Then in 1965, Sony released the CV2000. Fully transistorized, the product sold for $695 and was a tenth the size and weight of other products in its class. It came out at about the same time as Ampex's aforementioned VR1500. Other Japanese companies like Shiba Electric, the Victor Company of Japan, or JVC, and Matsushita soon followed with their own compact VTRs. But despite the small size, the good price, and company certainty that people in households want to tape their favorite shows for later watching, these compact VTRs did not sell well, same as with the Ampex VR1500. The Japanese companies narrowed on one crucial issue. These VTRs had their reels out in the open, making it complicated for people to handle the video magnetic tape. They also believed that the new machines should record and play color video. In April 1969, Sony developed a new way to put one inch tape into a cassette for easy loading, a video cassette player, or VCR. By 1971, this developed into the U-Matic. It was called that because the 3 4 inch tape traveled in a U-like path as it threaded around the helical scan video head. Sony then signed a cross-patent licensing agreement with JVC and Matsushita in 1970, trying to cement U-Matic as an international standard. The Sony knew that the U-Matic might have still been too large for the general consumer market. As early as 1970, they wanted to, and had the ability to, go even smaller. Such a machine might have been a hit. But Matsushita, you might know them better as Panasonic, and its majority-owned subsidiary JVC, did not have the manufacturing chops to produce such a complicated thing. So the three agreed on the U-Matic, a compromise solution that did not satisfy anyone. The product was still too large and bulky to handle, 61 centimeters by 20 centimeters by 46 centimeters, and it weighed about 60 pounds, more than a baby Atlantic white-sided dolphin. The device also cost quite a lot, about $2,000 per recorder and $30 per cassette, due to its high manufacturing complexities. So in the end, the U-Matic did not really catch on with ordinary households. It did do quite well in the professional and educational TV markets. A portable version, the Sony VO 3800, was widely adopted by local TV stations. It was another frustrating moment for Sony. People in the industry during the early 1970s knew that cassette recorded TV programs would be a thing. There was so much potential in the market just waiting for the right company and the right product. In 1968, an Ampex vice president, Richard J. Elkis, wrote an internal report calling for a shift towards the home market. So after a series of half-hearted failures, they decided to make the Insta Video. The Insta Video was relatively lightweight, played color video, and its tape cartridges were easier to use. The trade press and reviewers were ecstatic with the device, but Ampex failed to stick the landing. CEO William Roberts gave the task of manufacturing the Insta Video to an Ampex Toshiba joint venture in Japan. Roberts did this for several reasons. He doubted Ampex's ability to mass produce the thing in America, he was worried about possibly nurturing a domestic competitor, and he wanted to make sure that the product could be made compatible with Japan's video recording tape standards. But this joint venture, Tuamco, did not have good experience with consumer-level mass production. Before this, they only produced broadcasting equipment in limited quantities, so the JV struggled to produce enough Insta videos at a low cost. Furthermore, Ampex did not have much experience selling to the consumer market. Retailers and distributors never saw them as a reliable brand. And if nobody wanted to buy the Insta video, then content makers like the studios would not bother releasing content for the platform. Ampex was not the only video cassette system out there. Avco, a subsidiary of the conglomerate Textron, released the Cartravision in 1972. The $9,000 Cartravision was also a financial failure, losing $80 million in total. Ampex soon fell into financial troubles once more. They lost $12 million in 1971. Roberts never made it through the following year, 
resigning from his post in February 1972. The company would lose a staggering $90 million that year. The aforementioned VP Richard Elkis came back out of retirement like Michael Jordan and reorganized the spiraling Ampex, saving the company and 14,000 jobs. But as part of that, Ampex exited the consumer electronics business, which included InstaVideo. The company is still around today as Ampex data systems producing rugged compute solutions for the government. Ampex's withdrawal ended the last best chance for an American consumer VCR. From then on, the home VCR market belonged to the Japanese. By the 1980s, American firms only marketed products made in Japan. By mid-1974, Sony refined the U-Matic format to come up with a new, smaller version, Betamax. The Betamax system was far smaller. Sony co-founder Masaru Ibuka had tossed an American paperback book onto the table and told his team to make a VCR system with a cassette as big as that. They hit that size, but the cassette could only hold an hour of color video. Sony management at the time thought an hour would be enough, since that was how long a TV program lasted. In December 1974, Sony showed Matsushita and JVC the Betamax format and asked them to adopt it. Matsushita's management refused, partly out of pride, and partly because they felt that Betamax's one-hour limitation would make it hard to be accepted by the people. Sony also showed Betamax to RCA at around this time, and they said a similar thing. JVC refused for a different reason. They were working on their own next-generation pneumatic iteration, which they called Video Home System, or VHS. VHS's key requirement was being able to store at least two hours of color video. JVC general manager Yuma Shiraishi chose this after observing that most movies and sporting events typically lasted about two hours. Just to check on that, the average baseball game in 1974 lasted about two hours, 29 minutes. JVC, working in secret from its parent company Matsushita, achieved this at the cost of producing a cassette tape about a third larger than a paperback book. They only revealed the product to Matsushita a few days after Sony's Betamax demo. Sony believed that the U-Matic previously failed because Sony had to accommodate its partners Matsushita and JVC by watering down the product specs. So this time, they refused to budge on the Betamax's specs. According to a Japanese trade paper, both the chairman of Sony and Matsushita met in secret on a subway at a dark hour. The chairman of Matsushita argued that with VHS, they had found a way to get two hours of video on a single cassette if only it can get a little bit larger. But the Sony chairman refused to yield on the Betamax's smaller size. Refusing to compromise this time, Sony went ahead and brought the Betamax to the Japanese market in 1975 the American market a year thereafter. But by now, JVC had heard about the feedback from RCA and Matsushita. Now more confident than ever in their two-hour guideline, they decided to move forward with VHS, ramping it up for an October 1976 release. In mid-1975, Hitachi approached Sony about licensing the Betamax standard for their own use. Sony said no. Perhaps they were still trying to woo Matsushita over to their side. Perhaps they were still perfecting the Betamax standard. For whatever reason, they turned Hitachi down. Miffed, Hitachi turned to JVC, which was more than willing to work with them. JVC signed on other partners, Mitsubishi Electric, Sharp, Sanyo, and Toshiba, building a VHS coalition of the willing. In July 1976, Sony had a machine already in the market, but with La Grande Army VHS looming on the horizon, Sony went to MIDI to negotiate a settled peace. MIDI favored the Betamax since it was already on the market, clumsily trying to get everyone to adopt the Betamax. They managed to get Toshiba and Sanyo to defect, but the others stayed put. For the first year of the VCR's existence, Betamax had a first mover's advantage. Then VHS launched in October 1976, with JVC shipping white-labeled models to Sharp and Hitachi for resale. At first, Sony retained their lead. In 1976, the Betamax group retained 61.2% share, compared to 38.8% in the half-inch VCR industry. 
Sony was already about to extend the Betamax recording time to two hours, looking to invalidate VHS's biggest technical advantage. By itself, JVC lacked the scale to defeat Sony. For instance, RCA declined to adopt VHS in 1976 due to JVC lacking the production capacity to supply them with enough white-labeled VCRs. But then in January 1977, Matushita made their decision. After 14 months of study, they abandoned their old VX2000 VCR standard and announced that they would adopt VHS, supporting their majority-owned subsidiary, JVC. So, Matushita was kind of like Gandalf at the Battle of Helm's Deep, bringing with him a formidable manufacturing and distribution force. Matushita quickly introduced a series of low-priced VCRs to the Japanese market. These low-cost VCRs, built with extensive factory automation, undercut Sony, who struggled to produce their rather complicated machines at a comparable price. Sanyo brought out their own series of low-cost Betamax machines, but they didn't have the distribution muscle that Matushita had. Just as importantly, Matushita also had the technical chops to change the VHS format to win over specific partners. For example, in the super important USA market, winning over RCA, which controlled 49% of the color TV market, was essential. But RCA wanted a VCR that was capable of recording an American football game, which then lasted about three hours. Matsushita frantically spun up a team of 70 engineers. They halved the size of the diagonal recording track on the tape and slowed the recording speed to double the cassette capacity from two to four hours in specific modes. This four-hour mode compromised image quality, which apparently disgusted JVC's engineers. They refused to collaborate with Matushita on this effort, and JVC would not release a four-hour mode on their own VCRs until 1979. But RCA was impressed, and in August 1977, signed a white-label deal for 50,000 VCRs a month by the end of the year. Matushita then ramped up a new VCR factory, adding 10,000 units of capacity in just six months. RCA aggressively pushed VCR adoption in the United States by selling their VCR for $300 less than competing products. And those competing products can't record up to four hours. It was an amazing deal. Meanwhile, in Europe, dominant VCR player Philips and its German partner Grundig turned down both VHS and Betamax in order to pursue their own internally developed solution. JVC took advantage of this in order to recruit minor players like Telefunken, Thompson, Thorne, and Norman to VHS. And they rapidly adapted VHS to accommodate Europe's PAL color encoding video standard. Philips V2000 VCR would not launch until 1980. It was a good technical solution, but by then it was too late. VHS had already stolen the market. In 1979, VCR penetration in the United States was just 2%. By 1987, that would explode to over 50%, driven by cheaper, more powerful VCR machines and growing availability of pre-recorded videotapes. Notably, X-rated tapes also helped with that penetration, accounting for some 70% of the VCR tape rental market in 1978. By then, VHS had almost 60% market share, while Betamax just 40%. Within the VHS family, Matushita by itself made up 66% of shipped VCR capacity. Sharp, Hitachi, and Mitsubishi joined thereafter. By 1983, the VHS family had 75% of the market, Beta just 25%. That year, the industry produced a staggering 18.2 million VCRs, 15.2 million of which were for export. Japan would go on to produce over 30 million of these a year before Korean competition came into the picture. Betamax lasted into the late 1980s as Sony refused to end the product and violate the trust of those who did adopt Betamax, though they did eventually make their own VHS VCRs. Anyway, by 1982, the VCR wars were effectively over. VHS had triumphed. Later on, Sony chairman Morita admitted that the company had made a mistake in their approach. He and Sony should have worked harder to get more companies together in a family. The reasons they did things the way they did were understandable. 
there were some latent frustration there, but it did not work out. JVC and later Matsushita got the most VHS VCRs into people's hands first, and the family was more flexible in adapting the standard for customer demands, even if engineers had to hold their noses and just go for it. If you think about it, Sony underestimated the VCR. Industry analysts in 1980 predicted only 15-30% to of households would own a VCR by 1988. As I mentioned, the actual number turned out to be over 50%. VCR penetration in the United States peaked at 90% in 2005. Had Sony known how ubiquitous it would have become, perhaps they would have compromised. The home VCR remade the entire film and TV landscape. It changed the way we consume media, and it followed a remarkable technical journey to get here. In some ways, it was the pinnacle of mechanical consumer analog electronics. The thing that eventually replaced it would be entirely digital. All right, everyone, that's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel, sign up for the newsletter, and I'll see you guys next time.